Hi, I'm Bill Leckie, and in my latest Scottish Sun column, I'm looking at the early stages of a general election campaign, which, so far at least, reminds me very much of a phrase my granddad used to love. It's like two bald men fighting over a cone. If that's not a phrase you're familiar with, it basically means a scrap where the prize at stake is of absolutely no use to whoever wins it. And that's how I feel about the contest that's brewing between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. Two men who want power, who want the keys to number 10, but neither of whom seems to have a clue what to do once they get them. We are, of course, talking metaphorically bald men here because both have lustrous heads of hair. However, for voters in Scotland, there's a third player in this drama and he is follically challenged. His name is John Swinney. He's the leader of the SNP. And so far, his only policy, which he keeps repeating, seems to be that Scotland should have its own comb. We'll come back to John later. But let's look at the other two first. Rishi Sunak didn't so much fire the starting gun in this campaign as a water pistol. When he stood like a little drowned rat by a podium in the rain outside 10 Downing Street to tell us that the polls would be on July the 4th. He launched his campaign with the slogan, Labour doesn't have a plan. Which I have to say was a bit of a cheek from a man who didn't look out the window first to see what the weather was before he had that al fresco announcement. This is a man who inside his house has a £2.6 million state-of-the-art, very dry media centre. And yet, at a time when he tells us that the next five years, the next term of government, will be among the most dangerous and challenging Britain has ever faced. You can't check the weather. That doesn't bode very well, Rishi, does it? Now, he couldn't really have come out holding an umbrella because my paper and most other papers would have had him on the front page as the Wally with the Brawley. And he really couldn't have a member of staff hold a Brawley over his head or he'd have been a posh guy with a flunky. But... Surely he or one of his spin doctors could have said, look, it's really horrible out there. We're going to look daft. Let's have it in this room that Boris Johnson spent all the money on. There's a great idea. But instead, immediately, he loses credibility. And that, for me, has been the theme so far of this campaign. Not gaining momentum, but losing credibility. Now, Rishi's already lost 80 MPs. 80 Tories who have decided that they don't want to face humiliation at the polls and would rather quit. And so, like a man trying to fill a bucket with water when there's a hole in the bottom of it, he's trying to shovel in as many would-be MPs as he can. It's not a good look. And all of this, for me, should be an open goal for Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party. Now, he might well win by default. But I say by default because I do not know what the man stands for. I don't know what his policies are. I'm not, not sure he knows what his policies are. I'm not sure he knows what he stands for. I just think he knows that he's in charge and it's Labour's time and he has to go for it. Now, Tony Blair in 1997 sold a lot of Labour's principles down the, the river. But he did so openly. He did so knowing that he had to do it to get Labour elected. But I'm not sure Keir Starmer knows whether it's stick or twist, I don't think he knows where he wants Labour to go, but he still might be our Prime Minister come July the 5th. Now, up here in Scotland, he has a leader called Anna Sarwar. Now, Anna Sarwar's family runs a very large uh, wholesale cash and carry type business. And for years, there's been a lot of talk that they don't pay all their workers the proper living wage. Now, at the weekend, one of his first campaign interviews was with uh, Martin Geisler on TV, and Martin's a very tenacious reporter, who was always going to ask him about the living wage at his family's business. Because one of Labour's key policies is that everybody in Britain should be on a living wage. Now, you would think in that situation that he would go into the business and say, look, where are we, where are we here? Do we have any people who are not on a living wage? If they're not, please give them a rise now. Don't make me look stupid. But instead, he went to the, the interview where Martin asked him over and over and over and where Annas over and over and over shilly shallied and hummed and hawed and dodged round and danced round his handbag until eventually admitted, no, some people aren't on the living wage. 
Again, credibility down the river straight away. And while we're on credibility, well, let's come back to John Swinney. Now, anybody who reads my column regularly knows that I have been a heavy critic of the SNP under Nicola Sturgeon and all the way through since. And John Swinney's now taken over and I genuinely think a bit like Keir Starmer. He doesn't know what he's doing there. He doesn't know why he's there. He doesn't know what direction he wants to go in. And unfortunately, the way he's gone so far is inwards. Because the thing he got himself tied down with in the first few days of the campaign was the scandal of Michael Matheson, a former cabinet colleague of his, still an MSP, who was taken to task for trying to push through £11,000 in expenses for a roaming bill run up on his iPad during a holiday in Morocco at the start of the year. Apparently, his son's watching football was the reason. Now, I've tried to find out many, many times how you can possibly run up that amount of money when there's Wi-Fi everywhere in the world. But that's another story. The fact is, SNP didn't act on it. It eventually went to a standards committee at the Scottish Parliament who have decided that Michael Matheson should face a 27-day suspension. John Swinney, however, is refusing to endorse this suspension and prefers to stand by Michael Matheson because he says that during the process of the committee who gave him the suspension, someone within it was prejudiced against him. So there's been a bit of jiggery-pokery behind the scenes. Now, for me, this is more credibility loss. Yet again, like Starmer, like Sarwa, like Sunak, John Swinney just throws credibility away. Because all he had to do was say to Michael Matheson, look, there's an election to win here. Take your dumps, take your 27 days, come back, and we'll get started again. But no, he defends them. He defends the indefensible. And these are the things I don't understand. This is... I've argued many times that we are led these days by the least among us. And the opening days, the opening salvos of this election campaign only back that feeling up. Whether it's Rishi Sunak, whether it's Keir Starmer, whether it's Anna Sawa, whether it's John Swinney, none of them is a leader. You couldn't take them like Play-Doh and mash them into one good leader between them. And I genuinely don't know where we go, whoever gets in. If we are heading in to, as Rishi Sunak said, five years of danger and challenge. And who's the one that's going to take us through it? Who's the one that we can look at and say, yeah, I'll follow you. I know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. I genuinely don't know who that person is. Now, I look forward to the next few weeks of the campaign. Maybe someone will emerge as a, as a superstar who will say, yep, that's the one. But I doubt it. I think you probably doubt it as well. But we can only hope for the best while we prepare for the worst. All the best. Speak soon.